Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, this is Professor Payne. I'm the visual arts coordinator here at Baltimore City Community College, and I might say the proud visual arts coordinator of BCCC. <laughs> um, you guys are truly in for a treat this evening. I just want to welcome you all um, for being here. I know my students are here because they have to be here, <laughs> but thank you all still for being here. Um, I have a lot of people that are logging on, um, other schools, uh, family and friends. So we are so glad that you are all here um, this evening for our first, or this is our kickoff of many this um, going into the month of April of our artist um, lecture series of 2021. Um, we've been doing this um, for a minute. Um, but this time is, is a lot special because um, we're hosting a lot of other individuals and uh, partnerships, um, other feeder schools, um, and a lot of other people are joining in this evening. So this is, is really special. And as many people that know me, you know I can talk, but <laughs> I don't get too nervous. I'm a little nervous this evening. <laughs> but um, I thank you, thank you, thank you all for being here. Um, Brian, uh, we are featuring Brian Minofe um, this weekend. Um, I'm not this weekend, I'm sorry. We're featuring Brian Minofe this evening um, in his gifted hands and animation. And we are so, so glad um, that he's here. Um, but before we actually get started and going into um, Brian Minofe, um, we're gonna have a few words um, from our VP, Vice President of Academic Affairs, um, Leslie Jones. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Good evening, everybody. And I just wanna say, you know, back in January, when Professor Payne came, she said, you know, I have this crazy idea. And she outlined this whole uh, series of talks and the work that she's done. And I just could not say yes fast enough to give her the time to put this series together. Um, she's extraordinarily gifted, and she has put together a phenomenal series. And tonight, we are so thankful that Mr. Maynoffi could join us and to show our students what's possible for them in their future in the world of art. And I have to say, I think my, my children have actually seen some of your animation. So I am so excited to have you here today, and thank you all for joining us. And Professor Payne, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, VP Jones. Um, it's interesting because I've I've known Brian. I've I've known you probably half of my life cycle, more than half of my life cycle. <laughs> um, and you know, just to hear, you know, as VP Jones said, you know, some of the amazing things um, as my as we were digging deep into your um, your movie resume, <laughs> I, there were a lot of things that I hadn't even seen. Um, so definitely you all, we are definitely in for a treat this evening. Um, and my students definitely are, are more familiar with a lot of um, your work than I am. So I'm gonna read a little bit about um, Brian um, this evening, and then I'm gonna turn it over to him um, and so that he can start his presentation. Okay, so Brian Minofe started his animation career as an assistant to legendary animation director, Clark Chuck Jones. In the nearly three decades since, he has worked on dozens of films, including Pocahontas, Hercules, Tarzan, Mulan, Sinbad, and Curious George for studios such as Walt Disney, DreamWorks, and Universal. In television, he has worked as a character designer, storybook art and director on shows such as The Simpsons, The Boondocks, um, Dan versus American Dad, um, Duncanville, um, Paradise Island, and, and, and what are some other ones, Brian? I'm gonna let you jump in here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Professor Payne, and, and thank you everybody for allowing me uh, to come in and talk about my passion animation. Uh, thank you so much. Um, yes, my name is Brian Minoffi, and I draw cartoons for a living. Um, I am uh, was born and raised in Northeast Baltimore uh, in the Overly Hamilton area, and then um, 
I was extremely fortunate enough to get into the Baltimore School for the Arts, uh, where I was a visual arts major. And um, it, that was such a fantastic experience because it's the first time uh, being a teenager that you're surrounded by adults who are encouraging you to go into the arts and, and knowing that it's possible to have a career in the arts. And, and that was a, a tremendous boost uh, to me as an artist and wanting to continue drawing for a living as much as I could. After uh, the School for the Arts, I attended New York University, their film program, which at the time had a very small animation division. It was, um, I think there were five of us as seniors in that program. I think now it's uh, 150 in the program as animation has blossomed over the decades. Um, but of that small group at NYU, um, and, and it, was, it was tough being at NYU. I, I would love to say, I, I had a much better time at School for the Arts, to be honest. Uh, NYU was hard, it was expensive. I paid for it myself. I, I worked two jobs to get through it. It was a lot of work. Um, but being at such a prestigious place uh, helped me to even further hone my craft and, and work very hard to get into a position where I was, again, lucky enough that after uh, I graduated in the early 90s, uh, at that time, Warner Brothers was bringing back legendary director Chuck Jones. You may know uh, he created uh, Roadrunner Coyote. He did a bunch of the great Bugs Bunny cartoons that you know, Rabbit Season, Duck Season, and What's Opera Doc. Uh, he was brought back in his 80s to direct another Warner Brothers cartoon, and he decided that he wanted a young person as his assistant. And so he searched uh, uh, colleges, uh, 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 several around the United States and in England and Canada. And after all was said and done, I was the person that he picked and was given a few days to pack up my life and buy a one-way ticket to Hollywood. And so uh, uh, I had the extreme privilege of working directly with Chuck Jones, one of his final Roadrunner Coyote cartoon. And when that was done, uh, I moved over to Walt Disney Feature Animation, which had just released The Lion King. And so was in this expansive phase. And so I started working on the film Pocahontas. And I did a bunch of uh, movies there. And I've just sort of kept going since. It's, it's tricky. It's hard. Uh, staying in the business. It's a heck of a lot of work, which I'll get into later. Um, and it's, it's also funny because, like, um, and I'll talk about this a little more later, but I, I, at one point I worked for Seth MacFarlane for 10 years. And it, it, when you look back at that 10 years, like, oh, God, what fantastic. 10 years of straight work. But every single year, we thought that was the end of the show. So every year, we'd pack up our office, say our goodbyes, hug everybody, and leave and then wait to hear that the show got picked up and then bring everything back again. And there were times when we had to wait six months in between the show coming back. And there were times when by the time I drove home from the studio, there was already a message waiting on uh, my answering machine just saying that the show had been picked up and we were coming back. So um, while it looks uh, lovely and smooth in hindsight, uh, it, it is uh, a constant um, sort of uh, uh, being on the ocean, you know, it's waves, it's up and down and, and wanting to get through. Uh, and the big thing uh, for me has always been to just keep working hard, expanding my repertoire of, uh, of my drawing and the skills that I have so that I can always be employed somewhere. So I am going to start a little presentation that I've prepared for everyone to talk about the different jobs that are available in animation. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A and uh, we will try and get through as many as we can during my presentation and I can stick around afterwards. Yeah, um, and there'll be, um, as you know, Brian said, 
there'll definitely be a, a little bit more time at the end of his presentation to ask questions for Q&A. Oh, thanks everybody. So here we go. Professor Payne, can you see that screen? Yes. Wonderful. Yes. All right, so yes, these are some of the characters that I've drawn in my career. Uh, as she mentioned, I started working on a Coyote Roadrunner cartoon and then worked on uh, 10 feature films for Walt Disney, uh, starting with Pocahontas and going through some of um, some great movies to work on. Uh, Mulan, Tarzan, Emperor's New Groove, up until the time when uh, the, a digital revolution happened within animation and everything started being switched to being created on the computer. And Disney stopped drawing their movies and so the last one I worked on was Treasure Planet, and that's when we all got laid off as they switched to digital. So I worked on the last movies at Disney and then moved over to DreamWorks, where I worked on Sinbad, which was their last drawn feature film, and then moved over to Universal, where I worked on Curious George, which was the last drawn animated film for a decade. And so... Um, after that, I knew that as animation for feature films went digital and uh, it was, I, I knew personally, I did not want to sit in front of a computer clicking a mouse for my career. I wanted to keep drawing. So uh, with a lot of persistence and a lot of hard work, I moved into television. It took about a year or more to transition from features to television. Uh, just because they were such different worlds here in Hollywood with different groups of people um, traveling in those circles. Eventually, I did make the leap and worked on a number of shows, more than what I've listed here, because there's just so many um, that I've worked on over the years. Um, I was a character designer on The Boondocks. I was a storyboard artist on American Dad and Dan Versus, both of which were nominated for Emmys. Um, I directed the pilot for Duncanville and set some of the style, and I have been directing all three seasons of Paradise PD, and, and am now working on Farzar, which is just announced, and it is a Netflix TV show that I am directing and will be out sometime next year. I also have- Some, some of these are fairly new, Brian, on, um, on Netflix, right? Is Duncanville fairly new in Paradise well, Island? Uh, Duncanville is new. Its second season will be premiering this May. Like I said, I uh, directed the pilot that got the show picked up. I set the style. Um, but for too many reasons to get into, I wanted to stay with the show Paradise PD that I had been directing for Netflix. Farzar will be for Netflix. I also worked last year on a show called House Broken, starring Lisa Kudrow, that will be coming out again this May, and I worked on every episode, and that will be on Fox. So it's sort of um, all over. I mean, the Boondocks and American Dad play on, on Adult Swim. Um, uh, the Simpsons is always on at, at some point. Um, I'd like to say that um, you don't recognize my face, but I'm on television every single day. <laughs> Wait. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and let me let me ask you this question, Brian. Yeah. When you talked about the transition from going from one animation to another, from um, you said directing to going into television, directing movies from going feature into films, television. from feature okay. films into television. And and what what is what is that? How is that in the business? Well, in in. Um, uh, what's the simplest way to explain this? Is that it, difficult to do? It is, it is because it's a completely different set of skills. Mm -hmm. What I did as an animator at Disney has <laughs> almost nothing, I wouldn't say nothing to do, but the day-to-day -day is completely different from what we do in television. Mm -hmm. In feature films, we're animating uh, uh, the character, which, of course, you need 24 drawings per second. And so you're creating tens of thousands of individual drawings to get the character to move, act, and emote on the screen. 
and television. Um, and so at say a Disney feature animation, we were expected to complete two seconds per week. We had to do two seconds of film per week to get it done. And there are hundreds of us working at, uh, at that. And television, I do about, I think six hours a year worth. So uh, where we would spend um, two years creating an hour and a half movie, now I can create six hours a year in television because oh, wow. the quality is, is less. We do f fewer drawings. Um, and then also we're, we're planning, in television we plan everything out down to the last detail. And then it generally goes to a remote studio to be animated where they can get it done cheaper. And then it comes back to us to put any finishing touches on it. So process wise, it's a very different process. They're both artistic. They both require you to know everything about uh, proportion and perspective and composition, but it's as different as doing ceramics and oil painting, let's say. And let's see. So what I wanted to talk about today is that um, generally speaking, it takes a lot of dancers to put on a ballet or a lot of actors to put on a play. Generally though, visual artists work alone. We work alone in our studios. We hang our paintings in a gallery and we don't even have to show up to the opening if we don't want to. Animation is the exception for visual artists. It takes a great number of visual artists all coming together and working in tandem to create an animated film or TV show. And so as a director, I have 60 artists working under me uh, that I coordinate. And it's a great place for visual artists to all get together. There's a, a, a huge diversity of roles that you can play uh, where we need good visual artists. And it doesn't, it's not necessary in every role that you know how to animate or that you went to school for animation but just being a great visual artist is something we're always on the lookout for. And so I wanted to talk about the different roles that you can do in animation if you ever decide to pursue it. As I said, there are generally speaking two types of animation, feature animation and television animation. Feature animation is, uh, has, uh, uses a lot more money, a lot more time to create sort of a big project. And television, uh, takes the money and the time and puts it into creating as much as possible. It is a quality versus quantity to if you boil it down to that. So we're creating a, a, a lot of content that you, you watch on television, you laugh, and maybe you, you do or don't go back to watch it again. Whereas the feature films spend a lot more money and time because they're hoping that you will buy the, the DVD or the digital version and, and watch it with your children all the time. There's two ways of doing animation, which is computer generated and hand drawn. Over time, the uh, computer generated has, is now almost exclusively feature animation, while television has remained drawn animation. And that has a lot to do with uh, the price point, with how expensive computer animation still is. And so the money uh, to be able to do that can only really happen with feature animation. Television animation has to be done cheap and fast and drawing is always the best way to do that. So like I said, because I did not want to transition to a computer artist because I wanted to draw, drawing was important to me. The types of jobs that are in computer animation for features such as uh, modelers, riggers, texture mappers, uh, lighting artists, compositors. I know very little about that because it's not what I wanted to pursue. What I do is television. So today I'm going to talk a lot more about the process and pipeline of television animation. These are some of the job titles I'm going to explore. Animator, of course, the first thing we always think of. Concept designer character designer, background designer, prop designer, storyboard artist, and color designer. 
as you know, animation is what we all think about. Um, uh, the actual animating. This is some rough animation of the beast from Beauty, Disney's Beauty and the Beast. As you can see, it's not always fully drawn through. Once the beast, for instance, hits a certain pose with his legs and his legs are going to stay in that position, the animator doesn't have to keep drawing the legs every single pa page. These, these, um, these is hundreds of drawings that we're watching. What the animator is most concerned with is the acting, the movement and the posing, uh, it's timing, it's emotion, driving you through the story. And it's, it's a tremendous amount of work to do this. And all the animators are working as hard as they can, hundreds of drawings to get the best possible outcome. So this can I ask is, you this question, um, Brian? Um, a student wanted to know do you create the characters yourself or are you given details to create from what you're given? Is that the question? It is almost universal within animation that nothing is ever created by a single person. There will be uh, designers, concept designers, character designers, then the animator, they all work in tandem to create a character. And then once you've uh, created a character, like say the beast, with one person in charge, there will also be eight to 12 animators working underneath uh, that animator to get the work done. Like I said, if each person can do about two seconds a week, you gotta have eight people working at once just to get 16 seconds. And then they gotta work for a couple years before you can get 20 minutes uh, or, or whatever is necessary for that character in that movie. So, while there are always lead, a lead animator, let's say, or a lead character designer, there will also be a staff of artists that that person works with. And so everybody is contributing together. This is a, a, what I have up on the screen now is an example from Disney's Jungle Book. It is a, a Baloo. These would be the key poses. So an, a, a rough animator is interested in just the key poses to get the action and acting across. You can see from the numbering, it ends at number 331, which means that by the time this is done, there will be a full 331 drawings or about 13 seconds to this drawing. But the animator, him or herself, doesn't have to do every single drawing. There is another step of the process in which that rough animation is sent to a whole nother team of artists who go over the animation with a nice clean line, make sure that the character looks exactly the same in every drawing, and then fills in all the in-between drawings to make it smooth. You can see in this example, when it goes from rough to clean, that the animation gets smoother as well. That's because we've gone through and added all the drawings. This clean stage is what I did at Disney. Um, and so it was, my drawings that were actually on screen, the rough animators drawings never get seen by anybody in the, in the final product. These cleaned up drawings with every single in between in place is what gets colored and presented on screen. Eventually when I was at Disney, I rose up the, uh, the chain of command until uh, the movie Fantasia 2000, the Flamingos, Carnival the Animals, I was in charge of that segment uh, for the clean animation. Um, Brian, let me just interrupt just for a sec. Please. Chelsea wants to know, since we're talking about characters still, how amazing was the feeling when you first saw your work on publish on TV? Like, what was that experience for you? You know, it's, um, if I may be brutally honest, it's kind of a mixed bag because you're so excited to see your work up on a big screen, you know, going to see Pocahontas in the theater uh, with family and, and, and knowing that this is what we, we did for so long. But as an animator, you're, you know, you're working on a single drawing for an hour at a time, or maybe you're looking at a single scene that's only two and a half seconds over and over and over to make sure it's exactly right. So it's almost like when you see it all put together in order, you're like, 
who did that? That's wonderful. Like, I don't, I remember <laughs> two seconds at a time and out of order. So it's, it's, uh, it's almost as magical to watch it um, all come together as it is to know that you, you had a part in it, if that makes sense. <laughs> Uh, this is a quick example of some drawings of mine uh, from the Hunchback of Notre Dame. And once the drawings are uh, finished, then they go to color. The wars, capture fortune tellers, and and then readers. those exact drawings are what you get to see uh, going from our animation to color. Now, uh, computers have... All right, how do we Here we go. Um, computers have advanced to the point where they are able to set up certain parameters that allow you to sort of pull a character and get some limited animation out of their face as you go in real time. So you watch this uh, little example where they can set key positions. And then as you scroll, the, the computer sort of does the animation as fast as possible in real time. Now, I got to say, that is extremely difficult to set up. It, it uh, takes a, a very knowledgeable person a very long time to set that up in order to get that to work. Uh, so it's still not done very often, and you still need an artist to draw all, all these pieces at the beginning. So while um, computers are advancing towards being able to make the animator's job easier, it's not in any way uh, that the animator job is going to disappear uh, anytime soon. And all of this still needs a ton of visual artists going through to make um, that character is actually broken into about 25 pieces. And that's how the computer is able to adjust various elements to make it look like the head is turning. Um, and so all that still has to be with the addition. No. brought up. So I'm going to start with the job of concept designer. This is one of, I think, one of the hardest jobs in animation. When a movie or television show is proposed, then right away, everyone involved, producers, writers, actors, directors, everybody has a different idea of what this proposed movie or TV show will be. They have a different picture in their head. The concept designer is the job who is the first person to sit down and start drawing it. And what happens is you immediately find out that everyone involved has had a different picture in their head of what it's going to look like. And this is where all the um, committee and arguing and working to sort of get everybody together on one page to find out in which direction are we going to move forward in? Because everyone has a different view of what this movie could be. And a concept designer takes, this uh, is Ursula from The Little Mermaid. And so as soon as you say a sea witch, you now have to think, all right, which, which way are we going to go with this character? And so these are the various stages that uh, concept designers went through before we, they arrived at a design that everybody could get behind and say, this is what we would like to do. They also do gorgeous paintings to set the mood of the film. These are from the Netflix film, Klaus. Um, and, and so it's very much about with a few paintings, can we get everybody on board to, um, to want to go in the same direction together for how this film is going to make us feel. Uh, also, fun things like this are, are water splashes that we did in the movie Hercules. And if you may have never noticed, but anytime water splashes in the movie, it sort of forms a Grecian urn in the, in the patterns. And because animation, we can control every single aspect of this world. We can make water splash or smoke swirl or character designs have anything that we want. Uh, and, and so in this case, we were keeping a Greek theme through every aspect of the film. 
Next, I'm going to talk about character designer. This is one of the most fun things to do because everybody loves a good animated cartoon character. But these characters have to be designed and some of the best designers in the world work in character design for animation. The biggest thing is finding a style for your show and then making sure that every character design fits that style. So The Simpsons has a specific style. It's very different from Family Guy or very different from South Park. And in all of these cases, we're drawing, in this case, uh, former President Bill Clinton, be drawn in different styles that fit the show. And it's very important for figuring out that style and then making sure that every character works within it. Or taking an existing character like Wolverine and figuring out how are we going to present him in a new way for a new show. There will be at least 40 visual artists drawing this character at any time. And so it's important to create all the angles, dynamic shapes, mouth shapes, everything from that everyone needs to know so that 40 different people can all draw this character the exact same way. So it looks like only one person did it. So, Brian, what's an average amount of people that you'll be directing at a time sometimes? Is it 40 or more or? Well, what will happen is in order to get, if it, it takes a long time to do a television episode. It, it takes an average, let's say at least nine months to create oh. one animated episode. And so if you want to have an episode coming out every week on television, then you have multiple crews working at once. And so I may be uh, directly responsible for five artists, but also overseeing the work of the designers. It's another 10 artists, but those designers are working on every episode. So they have every director giving input for a couple weeks, they do episode one, and then for a couple weeks, they do episode two. If I'm doing every fourth episode, then I get to oversee them on episodes one, four, seven, you know, or, or uh, et cetera. So um, it's a large group of artists and you're constantly swishing back and forth to be working on this episode. And there will be times when as a director, I will be working on color for episode one uh, design for episode four, I'm creating episode seven, and I'm preparing episode 10 all at once uh, so that we can get all these episodes done uh, like a giant conveyor belt. Um, and I do have a, a student question. Yes. Um, they asked, do you ever draw your physical resemblance in many of your characters? <laughs> I've seen you. <laughs> um, as often as we can. Yes. <laughs> I, have, I have personally appeared in, I think, four different episodes of three different series so far. Um, and, and as much as you hear about, and look, let's be honest here, you hear about stories about someone drew sex in the clouds in Lion King or, or drew this naughty thing and something i can tell you these, these those never happen because in oh. animation we watch these shows a frame at a time constantly and so something like that would never get by every stage that it has to go through to get finished but we draw each other into cartoons all the time there are characters in mulan and hercules and princess and the frog and, and there's there are animators everywhere in the background of those shows. And, and um, <laughs> yes, I did. Um, and I am constantly caricaturing my coworkers and putting them in episodes. Oh, so yes, so yes. Uh, it, it's like a family reunion when we watch television. Oh, and that is such a compliment sometimes, though. <laughs> sometimes we get to blow up one of our friends or, 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 or do something uh, like that to them. And it's, it's, we find it hilarious. <laughs> um, here's an example of a character design model sheet. So the character designer goes through and designs every detail, the angle of the thumb, where the fingers meet, 
uh, how the elbow bends, uh, every little ding thing is put onto piles of model sheets that we all pour over and learn so that we can all draw the character in exactly the same way because you can tell when somebody can't draw Homer Simpson the right way. And so everybody on the show has to make sure that we all can, can do that. And a good visual artist will be able to switch between drawing Homer Simpson one year, drawing Looney Tunes the next year, drawing Disney the year after that, and being able to switch between those styles. Character designers also uh, responsible for all the incidental characters, the background characters. You know, the main characters get designed once, but then in every episode, there will be dozens of background characters, and that's what the char many character designers continue to work on after the main characters have been designed. So this is just an example of some of the female characters that were done in a season of American Dad. That's how many characters have to be designed over the course of a season. Also drawing the character from every angle so that it, when it goes to one of these remote studios to be animated, uh, the animators know how to exactly to draw that character no matter which way they're facing. We also have to draw every mouth position that'll be used for dialogue uh, as well. Uh, background designer. Background designers set the tone and the mood of a film or television show more than the characters, I would say. So a background designer, is it's important to, you can have an entire career in animation and never draw a cartoon character. In every TV show or movie, backgrounds exist and, and are beautifully done. And people talk a lot about the characters and maybe not always realize that all those backgrounds require a fantastic amount uh, or fantastic visual artist to create something this magical. This for instance is a, a background that our, our lead designer did for one of my episodes of Man's Chinese Theater here in Hollywood. And this is on screen for I believe two seconds. Uh, but the, the incredible artistry and detail that goes into uh, these amazing backgrounds. These are backgrounds from uh, Batman, the animated series in the 90s. And, and backgrounds are, the backgrounds themselves are another character in the show. They have mood and feelings and drive the story forward and um, wonderful designers who, who do architectural drawings, but are also doing moody drawings, atmospheric drawings. These are all important uh, for a good background design for your show. This is a background, I believe, from Disney's Pinocchio in 1940. Uh, the big thing to notice here is this big empty space right in the, in the front. That's because you are creating a stage for the characters. And so as much as you're defining a look, a feeling, a time period, they're also creating this space where the characters are going to act. And so a background designer works in tandem with the director and the animators to make sure that uh, the space is open and ready for the characters. So if you're someone who loves perspective and composition and uh, doing drawings that evoke a feeling. You can have a wonderful career in animation as a background designer. We are constantly looking for good background designers. Most people who go into cartoons want to draw the cartoon characters, but a background designer is worth their weight in gold, I think. Painters, um, painters make Brian, great background designers too. Um, just, yes. we, we have kind of like a slew of questions coming in now. So let me <laughs> um, just answer a few um, or ask a few. Um, with Hollywood not so friendly towards African Americans, this is what Mitchell's saying. Was the making of the boondocks your idea or their idea? Um, also, how much input did African American casts have in the making of those roles? Right. Yes, ab absolutely. Um, I, I, I did not come up with the idea of the boondocks. So the boondocks is, of course, uh, the comic strip strip created by Aaron Magruder, who is also from Maryland. 
Um, and we share the same birthday. Uh, he didn't think that was very funny. Um, <laughs> but his comic strip was popular enough, and I remember reading it, it it's, it's great, that uh, he paired with an African-American producer to bring it to television, um, Carl Jones. Uh, they got it launched. It became by far the highest rated show on Adult Swim, uh, which got it uh, keep moving. Um, I was a character designer under LaShawn Thomas, who, who is a fantastic designer, African-American designer from the Bronx, I believe, who came out to design the animated version of those characters. And so I worked for him. Uh, it was a fantastic experience. Um, Hollywood is, 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 is an amazing, uh, crazy-making, uh, uh, weird other world uh, machine that can very easily grind you up. And, and some people get ground up. Some people are able to fight the fight. Um, I sometimes say the fact that anything gets made that you can turn on the television and watch a show at all is kind of a minor miracle, uh, seeing how the sausage gets made. So there were many trials along the way to getting the boondocks done. It, you know, it started and stopped and restarted and stopped and restarted many times. And some of them were, some of them were the fault of people on the studio side. Some of them the fault of people on the production side. Some of them were the fault of, of everybody took their turn. Um, uh, uh, either, you know, both working hard to push it forward and sometimes failing. So um, it, is, it is a crazy complex situation. Uh, let me say that. Um, and then, and then um, if I ever come to Baltimore, buy me a drink and I'll tell you a lot more. <laughs> um, you, can, you can continue on. We'll, we'll okay, ask got, a few more questions. I've only got a little bit more. And okay. Then, and then I'll be happy to answer uh, any more questions. So after background, there's prop design. Everything a character touches, moves, picks up has to be designed as well. And um, thought about, thought through, whether it be very cartoony or more realistic. Um, uh, the entire world has to be created, every aspect, every little thing. And sometimes a, so a prop designer has to be very good at perspective, orthographic, linear, curvilinear, has to uh, be draw solid drawings, volumetric drawings. Again, you don't have to draw characters to be uh, contribute very important stuff to animation. Sometimes, as a prop designer, you will get a piece of paper and you just draw a rectangle and turn it in and it's great. And then sometimes you get something much more complex. So being able to draw volumetrically uh, and draw well is very important for prop designers as well. Now, storyboard artists, this is where I was for a long time. Story is the heart and soul of everything that we do. We are there all together to tell a story. And it's the story artist's job to map out every shot, every angle, the motion and the, the pacing that the story and characters are going to go through. Every story drawing done, and there are hundreds and thousands are done, are never get to be seen by anybody. It's all the animation drawings that get to be seen. You never get to see story drawings. But it takes a special kind of artist who, who understands cinematography um, as well as uh, and pacing and editing and, and uh, sound design, because you have to incorporate that into your storyboards, as well as being a good visual artist to, to communicate properly all these things that you're keeping in line to, to tell a story on film. Um, so it's, it's a lot of work and a lot of fun. Uh, in feature films, because like I said, this is where quality is, is position one, 
you will often get beautiful storyboards because the artist is trying to evoke a feeling that needs to stay through the entire process. It's going to go through 10 more departments before it's done. And so they are trying to uh, inspire all the later departments as well through their storyboards. In television, it's a little more about getting through it as fast as possible, getting the beats done, making it enjoyable, making it fun, and, and quickly moving on. There's different types of animated shows on television, such as um, the children's show, such as Ren and Stimpy, where it is about funny drawings. There's also action shows. The bottom row is from Justice League Unlimited. Uh, and, and action shows usually don't, not, not funny drawings, and usually not very emotionally centered drawings, but pacing and action is what is most important in shows like that. And so it's just a different way of drawing. I've spent almost in my entire television career in prime time animation, which is sort of a combination where the artist has to draw every angle. You can see that you can tell exactly where the camera is based on the angle of the room in every drawing. And when, where the camera moves are, what the angles are, how the characters will be acting within each shot, we really map out in great detail everything that's going to happen uh, so that other departments then just follow our blueprint uh, to keep it moving forward. And so we'll do, you know, a thousand drawings to get a TV show uh, put together, even though you may never see those drawings specifically. And then lastly, I have color designer. Color design, painters make great color designers because once all this art is drawn, it has to be colored for final thing. And, and color designers can make or break a show and do fantastic work. This is a model sheet that uh, I worked with our head color designer to create for an episode I did of Paradise PD in which uh, the characters assume Dungeons and Dragons persona and go into a dark forest. The problem was going to be, how do we have characters wearing green or are green on a green background through the episode and still have it read. And so I worked with our head color designer to create a background, which I drew, and then had it all colored in uh, cool greens, which means there's more blue than yellow in the greens. Those cool greens tend to sit back. And then we colored all the characters in warm greens, which means more yellow than blue. So the characters try to, uh, that warm colors rise forward. So by putting the warm on cool, we were able to make sure that the characters always read beautifully uh, on these backgrounds, even though we're using so much of a single color. And this is a color script. Color script is just that, where the color designer goes through and will take a sequence. This is from the animated film Mulan. And create the a color color bars to show how the color is going to affect the mood and drive the story in this sequence. Uh, this is the training montage and you can see how much blue there is in the first half and as the characters are doing everything wrong and not able to sort of form together to a, a cohesive army unit. But then when Mulan climbs up, is able to climb up and retrieve the arrow, that's when dawn breaks, so, so we get this yellow coming in to counter the blue. And then as they progress and start to work together, we get more yellow, then red. As they start getting really good, now the colors are changing to red. And you'll see at the center bottom row, one blue panel. That's the model they've put up of the bad guy that they then blow up. So as they're getting more and more from blue to red, as the training montage progresses, then when we see the villain, the villain's blue. Now he's the opposite of where they are and they blow him up, which makes the screen go completely red. And that's how we know that they have achieved their goal. So color is being used as another clue to help in the storytelling through this process. So as I, as, as I was explaining, it, it takes a tremendous amount of visual artists each doing their part um, 
to come together and create one final cohesive animated film or TV show at the end. Um, I love doing it. I love drawing all day, every day for a living. I've never had a job that wasn't drawing for animation. Um, and if it's something that you would like to pursue as well, I would say um, it can be a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, a lot of work, <laughs> but a lot of fun. And, and something comes to mind when you say you, you draw all day. <laughs> so if you weren't doing anything else, Brian, what else would you want to do if you weren't doing this? I, I, Is there anything else that you would rather be doing? Oh, you um, become an animator. Okay. All right. I hope I don't take too <laughs> much time for this. Um, when I was in New, when I was uh, in school in New York, um, I was lucky enough uh, to uh, work with um, learning kung fu from a, a an older Chinese gentleman who had grown up in the monasteries in China, um, fought in several wars, killed hundreds of people. Uh, eventually emigrated to the United States, spoke no English. There were a group of six of us. We learned Chinese so we could talk to him. And he trained us on his rooftop in Kung Fu. Wow. Like and the Karate Kid? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it's funny because I feel like I remember you, maybe it was just the costume or what you wore, but I feel like I remember you in high school dressing up in some type of like martial arts type of Clothes. Is that true? Is, is, you know, is, had, is that my memory? I had done martial arts in high school, but it wasn't until I got okay. to college that I, I was, again, lucky enough to hook up with a group of people who were learning from a genuine uh, uh, grandmaster. We opened up two schools in New York, and wow. um, I taught seven days a week at the school as I was finishing my animation classes and I could have seen myself teaching Kung Fu for a living. And then I got the call from Chuck Jones to come and do animation and, oh, you know, so I came out <laughs> and, uh, and, and started my animation and, and sat at a desk. So I don't really do Kung Fu anymore because I sat at a desk all the time. But when Mulan was started at Disney, um, they had initially unfortunately grabbed a bunch of samurai movies, which are Japanese, and sort of had all this Japanese stuff in their Chinese movie. And I was able to tell them, no, 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 you, you, you don't need a katana, you need a gim, and this is how you use it. And so I ended up choreographing all the martial arts in Mulan, including that bit at the end where she traps the sword in the fan and twists it out of the bad guy's hand. That was all that was all mine. So I was still able to contribute to an animated film um, as Kung Fu as well as art. Okay. Okay. All but right. So life if Chuck Jones hadn't called. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a few questions from students. Um, so we're going to start our Q&A. Um, and Chloe says, when you're drawing specifically for shows, movies where characters are meant to move with the music do you work in tandem with the musicians composers scene by scene yes de most definitely if if the, uh, in fact um the the sound and dialogue always comes first so we will we will get a, a audio track of the actors talking and then we will animate to that uh, so that we can make sure that the lip sync uh, hits right on. And then on uh, Fantasia 2000, for instance, where we were doing these shorts to the music, it was the same thing. We would get a piece of music. In this case, we were doing uh, um, uh, the Carnival of the Animals from Saint-Saëns. And uh, that music would then be transcribed onto an exposure sheet laying out the beats and um, when different pieces of, of, of the music uh, hit in. And so we had the music to listen to, and we also had a visual representation of the music so that we could animate to it. Uh, so yeah, so if something is being timed to music, 
or of course, just timing to the dialogue, all that sound has to be done first. Um, I think our next question is from Veronica. She has her hand raised. I think uh, Renata is going to let her ask her own question. You there, Veronica? Yep, one moment. Hey, Veronica, you had a question? We'll just go to, you there, Veronica? Yes, I'm here. Okay, babe. <laughs> you have a question? Um, I wanted to know how do you use the animation to make your pictures come to life? Is that like through an app that you have downloaded on your computer? Is it something that we can get? I saw you making the beast. Yeah, so, you know, originally, when, when I, I'm, I'm so old that when I started, uh, we did everything on paper. And so we would have stacks, reams of paper where every, every piece had a drawing on it that was slightly different. So you'd roll these huge stacks of paper at the end or photograph them one at a time under the camera in order to get the animation to move. Now, uh, we all use these big uh, Cintiq tablets. So it's a with a 28 inch big screen that we draw on with stylus. And so um, while I am still, I am drawing on a computer, I, I'm still drawing by hand. Now the program that I use um, is called, there's a, a company called Toon Boom. Toon Boom makes a variety of programs for each step of the animation process. As a storyboard artist and director, I use the program called Storyboard Pro. Uh, it's a couple hundred dollars. Uh, unlike the com computer animation, in computer animation, those programs are generally proprietary and cost thousands of dollars and have to run on machines that are thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, for drawing, for drawing, for television, we have a, uh, a large tablet screen and we draw on that with the program, it's a couple hundred dollars. Um, so it is, it is feasible to get this stuff, but I know, I know lots of artists now who take their iPads uh, with them to the zoo to draw or out to the park to sketch. I still love drawing on paper. It's how I was taught. And so I have a, a stack of sketchbooks that I use when I want to go out and sketch or draw for myself. And if I want to do a drawing, um, I have a whole setup uh, for drawing on paper. And I, I hoard my old animation paper. It's getting harder and harder to buy. Just because I believe that if when you do a drawing on a computer, it, it's fine. It looks exactly like you're drawing. But then if you want to give it to somebody, you have to print it out. And if you want to give it to someone else, you print it out. You can do all these printouts. And so it's not really, what is it worth if you can print out one or a thousand? I like doing drawings on paper, in pencil, so I can sign it and give it to somebody and they know that it's a one of a kind. That's, a, that's me being old. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Thank so we'll, oh, I'm sorry, Veronica. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so we'll go to the next question from Angela. Um, she has two more questions. <laughs> Which productions contain off the top of your head um, your three favorite examples of your own work? Three favorite examples of my own work. Okay, well, I got to say I'm awfully proud of that ending moment in Mulan. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, everybody remembers that they've even made toys of that, which I, which I have up here somewhere. So, uh, definitely like that. Um, I was very proud of working on Carnival, the animals, the flamingo section of, of Fantasia 2000. It was a small group. We worked really hard. It was my first time being in charge of something. And, um, 
so that has a special place in my heart. And then um, generally it's, since I've been directing, it, it, is, it is fun when, uh, you know, you get a script, so you have to do the show according to the script, but every so often you come up with something that you're like, oh, this is, this is a funny drawing that's gonna enhance it, or this is a moment where if I do this extra bit, it's just gonna punch it up even more. And so you do and everybody laughs and then you're like, yes, that was my idea, my drawing, everything done right, made people laugh, that was good. And, and that happens, that happens a couple times an episode. You know, maybe twice an episode. You get to really uh, go the extra mile, push it somewhere, and, and get an extra laugh out of it. And, and finding that moment each episode. Because uh, you're mostly, like I said, you're doing the script. You're getting the beats. You're getting the work done. You have a tr crushing deadline that you have to draw these two. But when you have that inspiration, you're like, oh, if I just do this extra couple drawings, it'll be worth it. And it is. That's nice. I'm sorry, uh, Professor, we can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we have a few more questions. Uh, Monet, Monet says, what mostly inspires you working on animations? Oh yes, well, you know, now, honestly, uh, to be completely honest, it's the people I work with. Um, because I have worked on some very popular shows and movies with some very awful people. And it doesn't matter how popular the end product is. I don't remember it fondly. And I also work on some shows with, with wonderful people. And, and that's what I am all about now, is, is, is working with good people, because life is short, and, and, and art is hard. And, and, and so I think the greatest thing that, I'm, that um, makes me happy to go to work each day now is I, I, am, I am in a place where I am working with fantastic artists, fantastic people, uh, and that makes a world of difference. You hear me now? Okay, so let's see. Lorraine wants to know, have you ever had a shelf, um, I'm sorry, have you ever had to shelf a character because it didn't come out as you expected? Um, yeah, well, you know, it's, um, like I said, this is a big, a big process with a lot of people. And there's often times as a director where I have a very clear vision of what I need a character to look like. And I'll work with the character designer to do it. And then the creator will come in and go, oh, oh no, I just wanted him to be plain and simple and boring. And you're like, but, 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 but we could do this. And they're like, no, 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 no. And all right, you're in charge. We'll make it plain and simple and boring. Um, there, there, there are many times, there's give and take at all times. There are times when I, I will push for something. There's even times when I've rearranged some of the writing to make it work better. And the writer has been, oh yeah, that is better, Whew, you know? And then there's times when I'm very clear about what I want and it doesn't go through. You win some, you lose some. You know, maybe if you can win more than you lose, that's good. But at the end of the day, everybody owns it. Everybody's working on it. Everybody's giving their all. And so you take, you take what you can and you let everything else flow by because there's gonna be another battle tomorrow as well. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Um, I have another question. I'm not exactly sure if I understand the question, but you may understand the question. Um, Angela wants to know, can you tell us about what fans call Easter eggs and anything you, mm -hmm. you've worked on? Um, I understand if they need to say a secret or if they don't exist. Easter eggs all the time. 
we put in so many Easter eggs. And it's because, like I said, when you're working on a drawing for a long time or on a scene that's gonna take days to finish and you're working, and honestly, you're working 12, 14 hours a day, six, seven days a week, either you get punchy or else it's just fun to put them in. So they're, they're, the show that I was working on, Paradise PD for Netflix, is a gross out show. It is foul humor, bodily functions, um, and it is funny as hell. It is so funny. And Netflix, being a network or, or, or a studio, let's say, that does not have standards and practices, um, you can get away with anything. And so it's very popular right now for animated shows that get away with a lot of stuff you could never see on television. It'll probably be popular for a couple more years before everybody gets used to it and we move on to other stuff. But right now it is very popular. And I did an episode, I directed an episode that was very anti-Disney. And it was dumb luck that this was my episode having um, been the only person at, on the show who had worked at Disney. And so I decided I was going to fill that episode with Easter eggs. So if you watch this episode, this anti-Disney episode from um, Paradise PD, it, it has everything from uh, hidden Mickeys throughout the episode, because you know how Disney uh, will hide Mickey Mouse shapes in their films. I threw in hidden Mickeys all over the place. Uh, I made references to obscure uh, Walt Disney facts. Um, we threw in all kinds of stuff, everything we could think of. In the couple weeks we had to do the episode, uh, we threw in there and the creators thought it was hilarious. Even the ones they didn't get, they knew that people out there would know what it was. So yes, we try to throw in as many of those as possible. Um, it's, it's never a lot because we have work to do. We got to get through, you know, the episode as well. But if there's a chance, we will take it. It's the only thing, it, it makes it fun. Okay, so we have a hand raised. Um, I'm going to let... Hey, Lorraine. I'm sorry. Question? Okay. You there, Miss Lorraine? I'm there. I don't have a question. It was unraised by accident. It was raised by accident. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So we'll go to um, Cache's question. Um, what is one of your best creations? My best creation besides my kids? I um, know that's <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's very much like kids. They're all different. Uh, you, you love them all, different, you know, and, and um, I'm proud to have worked on everything. The popular, the unpopular, um, the stuff people can recite back to you and the stuff people have never heard of. Um, because every, every one of these projects I've worked on has enabled me to... to pay my mortgage, pay my bills, put my kids through college and, 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 and then move on to the next. And it's that, that forward momentum um, that, that I appreciate and that I keep working hard to continue doing. Um, every day I get to draw for a living is a win for me because that's what I wanted, to draw for a living. And I look at the kids coming out of school now and they're so good. They're so good. And they know the technology really well. And, and I, I want, I'm, I'm constantly making sure that I, I'm struggling to stay ahead of them because everybody's so good. And there's so much new stuff coming out. And there's so many new shows, not even the shows I see, but the other shows that my friends are working on. And um, animation can do anything. And there are people out there doing incredible stuff with it. So I'm constantly trying to keep up with the world of animation, with um, the techniques of animation, experimenting myself on my own time with new techniques, just so 
I'm ready and that I'm always on top of stuff and can always be relevant and always move forward. Hollywood will roll over you and kick you aside in a heartbeat. Um, but I, I want to stay in it and stay where it takes a lot of work, takes a lot of dedication. Um, but again, I can't think of anything else I'd want to do. That's a blessing. That's truly a blessing. We have one other question from Monet, and then we're going to let Solomon ask a question. Um, and I was just about to call him out because I know he was so excited that you were going to be here. Um, I, 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 uh -huh. I unfortunately have a meeting to go to in, in a half hour. So Okay. Okay. Well, you, you know what? We only have a minutes. few more minutes. So we'll Absolutely. let these be the last two questions. And then we have no something for you. Um, and then we're going to sign off. <laughs> um, so Monet wants to know, um, how do you handle tight deadlines? Um, uh, it's rough. I got to tell you, it's rough. When I, was working, <laughs> when I was working at Disney, we had to work a minimum 12 hour day. You weren't allowed to work any less than 12 hours. Uh, we worked seven days a week for six to nine months of the year. That meant uh, no Sundays off, no, no holidays. Uh, we worked in order, if, in, the pressure was so great to get those movies done on time and they were so big um, that we had to work yeah, 12 to 16 hours a day, seven days a week, six to nine months. Um, I one time uh, blew the, the, the vein on my drawing finger, um, burst it. And so my whole finger turned purple and swelled up. And Disney has a clinic on site to repa help <laughs> repair and uh, um, get your hand back working again so you can get back to drawing. Um, um, I've torn or, or, or frayed my rotator cuff muscle from, from drawing too much. Wow. Um, it's, it's, uh, the, the, the deadlines are crazy. Mm -hmm. um, you, you deal with it in many different ways. There's uh, complaining, <laughs> you know, in order to get more time, uh, which, you, which you may need. Um, there's also scaling your work. So if, they, if somebody says, look, we want you to do this 10 seconds of animation and we'll give you a year to do it. They're gonna get the most beautiful piece of animation back they've ever seen. If they want 10 seconds of animation, they give you a day to do it. <laughs> you know what you're getting in the end of a day. So part of it is saying, I am going to work this much and you will get what you paid for. Yeah. And if you want it to be better, you gotta give me more time and pay me for more time. And that's, that's what it is, you know? So scaling your own expectations um, and what you're willing to do um, is of paramount importance. Okay. okay, so we have one last closing question from Solomon, who is probably one of your biggest fans. <laughs> oh, gee, thank you. So um, Renata, are you gonna let Solomon ask his question? Yeah, he's ready, he's already in. Go ahead, Solomon. <laughs> all right um i have this question i have do you have a like do you have tips on like uh, for upcoming animators because i i always want to be an i always want to be an animator actually i i love making cartoons because i actually pull up a, a cartoon on my to like to show but i but i know you're busy for it <laughs> tips tips for becoming an animator Yes. Yes. Well, I think the most important thing that any artist can do is life drawing. Uh, everything stems from life drawing. So I think if you can get into a, uh, uh, some life drawing classes, it's only going to make you a better artist. Mm -hmm. There are a number of books out there, I don't, or you may already have a bunch of them, um, mm -hmm. for the how to do the process of animation. These books can be very helpful. Uh, so for instance, the, the classic, the Bible for animation is called The Illusion of Life. The Illusion of Life. The oh. Illusion of Life. And it's a very large book written by some of the greatest Disney animators. It was published 40 years ago or more. 
Um, so that's sort of our Bible, our classic text. There's been a lot more recent books. My boss, who's brilliant, wrote a book called The Animation Crash Course. That's Eric Goldberg wrote The Animation Crash Course. It's a wonderful book that shows you some of the basics uh, that then you can start practicing on your own. And then in general, I would also say to go out and sketch from life, sketch people at the park, sketch people on TV uh, while you're watching. If you can go to a zoo or a dog park and sketch the animals, sketching from life, because what we are doing in animation is movement. We are drawing movement. And so drawing, it's one thing to draw someone standing still or drawing a statue, but drawing someone moving, you're trying to capture the essence of their movement. So go out into the field and draw people moving. It's, it's hard. It's hard because they're not standing still. But you'll start, you keep at it, you're going to really start to find the shortcuts, the visual language that will help you move forward. And I really hope you do. Keep, keep working at it. Okay, will do. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so we have a treat myself and my students. Um, we have a couple of remarks that we want to get um, from Dean Vance, um, but we definitely, my students have been working on something as a gift as and a thank you to you, Brian. Um, Kiana, you want to take the lead on that and introduce yes. yourself? Oh, hi, my name is Kiana and I'm a student from the Art in the Culture class. And in our class, we've had the opportunity to look at different artists um, from all around the world and especially in Baltimore. Um, and not only just uh, see their art from their perspective, but also become the art. So uh, we put together something for you and I hope you enjoy. Thank you. That is fantastic. Thank you so much. I need a copy of that, please. <laughs> I am in love with that. 
Yeah, look, we my <laughs> students have been, I'm so proud of my students. They yes. have been doing creations all semester long. They are so oh. amazing. Thank you so much. I had a group of students actually put that presentation together. They couldn't be here this evening. Kian is part of that group, but they put it together at the last minute because they were so excited um, for this presentation. So we that thank you. My thank year. You. <laughs> thank you. Yay. Thank you okay. all so much. I really appreciate you showing up and listening to me rabble on and on all this time. And and I really hope if you if you are passionate about animation that you keep going it. We need more representation. We need uh, more voices to be heard. And and I really hope everybody can get a chance to move forward. So thank you. And our last closing remarks outside of me saying thank you to everyone for being here this evening um, is the interim dean, Vance. Um, Vance, are you there? Yes. Listen, Brian, on behalf of Baltimore City Community College, faculty, staff, and the administration, we thank you for what you do and bringing art, film, animation to the classroom and to our college. And a time like this, we do need animation to laugh, love, learn, and grow. Professor Payne, outstanding job. And to the students, thanks for what you do. And Brian, I may need to sign up for one of your courses so that I can continue <laughs> laughing and learn to heal in the process. Once again, thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Interim Dean Vance. And again, 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 I wanna thank everyone for joining in. Um, thank you to all of my students for creating that wonderful presentation. Um, everyone had a hand in this um, uh, for all of the, the partnerships that we have with BSA, um, Coppin Academy, um, and to my tribe. Um, uh, I have some friends and family and some other amazing artists, Brian, um, some other people, I don't know if you remember, Tony, Darren, Alvin, they may be in the Zoom somewhere. Um, and also Baltimore Design School. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for being here. And to all of the people that, uh, that came out to really make this happen, Renata, um, Director of Events, and Vidra, Michael Barans, VP Jones. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. And the students are saying thank you in the chat too to you as well, Brian. So I want you guys to have an amazing evening. And, um, and also I'm saying like happy uh, early spring break. <laughs> thank you. Have a wonderful, wonderful spring break. And thank you again, um, Brian. Thank you.